chapter 32, section 4, titled Environmental Activism. So during the 1970s, Americans uh, worked to strengthen their efforts uh, to address the nation's environmental problems. And I'd first like to talk to you about a famous book, Silent Spring. Now, Rachel Carson's groundbreaking book in 1962 helped to make the average person aware of their impact on the environment and help to make the common person aware that what they do matters on a big scale. That the earth may be a self-regulating system, but that the, the worldwide human population has become unsustainable to the point where our impact matters in the long term. Uh, you know, a couple of her key points were that pesticides that is poisons designed to kill insects and other unwanted pests, um, actually hurt the food that we eat, um, as well as harmless animals. And it became a national bestseller. It actually led to a presidential commission. John F. Kennedy uh, established an advisory committee uh, and studied the claims that she was making and found <clears throat> that it was accurate. But yet, guess who claimed that these things were made up. Those who stood to profit, often environmental, uh, not environmental groups, but chemical companies, uh, claimed that she was making all this junk up. <coughs> but the effect of this was that it started a national conversation. From here, it appears conservationists have done a good job. And in fact, they have. Uh, much of America is still America the beautiful. And compared to most countries, we do a superb job of caring for our environment. In the 1960s, though, a new debate erupted uh, beyond wildlife, beyond wilderness. It was a debate about just one species, us. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, created what we now know as environmentalism. She was an inspired writer. Her first great book was The Sea Around Us. In that and later in Edge of the Sea, she railed, just as John Muir had, just as Aldo Leopold had, at man's arrogance. Before Silent Spring hit the stands, people thought that pesticides and herbicides were miraculous, a real high point in our attempt to control nature. But Silent Spring pointed out, in Carson's riveting way, that pesticides weren't just killing insects, they were killing us. Rachel Carson's warnings about pesticides are now almost universally accepted, but her more comprehensive ideas about man's capacity to prevail are not. I truly believe that we in this generation must come to terms with nature. And I think we're challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. Carson died of cancer at 56. She regretted deeply that she had come to her terrible knowledge too late to personally do more about it. So her book raised awareness, meaning that it got the common person talking about an issue that they might not previously have discussed. And um, so, so that's been a big part of the campaign because to get a significant change in the environmental impact of such a large population, it requires getting people to make good choices. And we're only going to make good choices if we think about it often you know of course another big push in another lucrative industry if you're interested in anything in the technology field is sustainable technology uh you know in environmental impacts in emerging industries um is, is a great field to go into and uh and so making things convenient but also making us think about it and so that was the purpose of earth day first observed in 1970 uh by communities and we still observe this every year uh what can the government do well, it does depend on who's in power. Uh, and so, you know, that depends on how we vote and what we prioritize when we vote. Uh, you know, for example, 
Uh, Richard Nixon was not an environmentalist. That is someone who was an active protector of the environment. However, um, he did sign the Clean Air Act. Uh, he did create the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is the main kind of government watchdog in environmental issues. Uh, and throughout the 1970s, Congress did pass 35 different laws on conservation, which required cleanup, required companies to be more environmentally responsible. With climate change, we face a choice, action or inaction. If we don't act, the global average temperature will continue its rapid climb, and the temperature changes in the United States will mean serious impacts across all sectors of the U.S. economy. Today, we are already seeing more extreme weather, rising seas, changing rain and snow patterns, and more drought. These impacts and others are expected to worsen with climate change. But what if we come together as a global community to address climate change? EPA's newly released Benefits of Global Action report looks at the consequences if we don't act and the payoff for the U.S. of global action. If we act on climate, all Americans, especially our children and grandchildren, will see the benefits in our health and our environment. We can prevent tens of thousands of premature deaths annually in the United States by the end of the century through air quality improvements and less extreme temperatures. By the year 2100, we can cut the increase of severe drought by half and avoid more than $10 billion in agriculture losses per year, helping keep food prices affordable. We can prevent billions of dollars in infrastructure costs by the end of the century, cutting the number of vulnerable bridges in half and saving Americans approximately $3 billion in annual costs to coastal property and up to $7 billion in road repairs. We can prevent the most severe climate impacts if we act now. The choices that we and the global community make today are the legacy we will leave to our children and grandchildren. U.S. leadership is crucial to global climate action. The Clean Air Act established by Congress obligates us to protect the health and welfare of Americans today and tomorrow. That's why EPA is taking action to address the largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. EPA's Clean Power Plan will cut hundreds of millions of tons of heat-trapping carbon pollution from power plants, while cutting harmful smog and soot-forming emissions, too. Our fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks will cut over 6 billion tons of carbon pollution and save Americans $1.7 trillion at the pump. We're acting to make a difference on climate change. So. I want to have a brief discussion about balancing environmental conservation with economic progress. And I'd like to use the example of the Alaska pipeline. So the argument with the Alaska pipeline was that it would create jobs. It would bring a steady source of oil from Alaska to the lower 48. Uh, it would increase revenue by fostering efficiency and alleviate um, many of the economic woes of our country with our foreign dependence on oil. But the counter argument was that creating a pipe from Alaska to the lower 48 would have an environmental impact on the wildlife, on the native people that the pipeline goes across their lands. Um, but yet it was built. Despite any debates about the social environmental impact, it was built. Uh, because the economic benefits overshadowed the arguments about the environmental impact. Um, you know, nonetheless, you know, public lands have been set aside. Millions of acres uh, have been given to native tribes for conservation, for public use. Um, you know, if, for example, in the Jimmy Carter administration alone, 56 million acres of American land were set as national monuments. Uh, and by 1980, Congress had added another 104 million acres uh, of protected land. Another debate going on in our country is how do we make energy in a sustainable way? How do we produce energy? Well, in 1900, the main source of energy production was coal. But by today, uh, we are producing more 
renewable energy than we ever have before. Wind, solar, hydro. Uh, hydro does have an environmental impact, so the big pushes have been wind and solar. Again, there are power companies that will put solar panels on your roof of your house free of charge, and you're contributing to the power grid in a way that hurts no one. Um, but one of the debates, especially in the 1970s, was about nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is a potentially sustainable, indefinite form of energy production. However, it's very dangerous. You're essentially containing an, an, an atomic reaction, and you're continuing to contain that atomic reaction that if it's not properly contained will melt down and become an atomic bomb. And so we have the capacity to contain an atomic bomb and produce energy from it. However, even as amazing as that technology is, and go tour a nuclear plant sometime, it's pretty incredible how they do this. There is the potential for failure. You know, what if, what if one of these plants fails? Well, I can give you two examples where they did. Number one is Chernobyl. Obviously, you've heard of it. It's still not safe to go there. Number two is Three Mile Island. In March of 1979, the reactor at Three Mile Island malfunctioned. This is just outside of New York, by the way. Um, even though after the initial failure, the reaction was contained, a low level of radiation escaped the plant and 100,000 people had to be evacuated from the area. And it was quite some time before this area was even deemed safe enough to return. And it, it, it did prompt people to ask that question. As amazing as this technology sounds, you know, a potentially indefinite renewable source of energy, what happens if it fails? Is it worth the risk? You know, are these plants truly safe? Uh, we still use nuclear plants. Uh, you know, the closest one to here is Lake Kiwi, the power plant right, right outside of Lake Jokassi. Uh, you can go. Again, I encourage you to take a tour. The safety measures are quite incredible. Um, and it is, a uh, again, a somewhat renewable source of energy, though the containment and the waste disposal measures are rather expensive uh, and can have their own impact. The billion-dollar plant sits on an island in the Susquehanna River, 10 miles southeast of Harrisburg. It was immediately sealed off, and authorities say it will stay closed until state and federal officials finish their investigation. The nearest residents, about 200 yards away across the river, were not evacuated. Workers who were in the plant at the time of the accident are being examined. Some may have been contaminated. The accident occurred when a valve blew out of a water pump that cools a nuclear reactor. Authorities say some radioactive steam escaped into the atmosphere. One official said readings taken at the plant showed less radiation present than a person would absorb from a chest x-ray. But a later check showed higher readings. The accident automatically shut down the nuclear reactor, but not before the radioactive steam had leaked out. Joe Templeton, ABC News. The next debate that we need to have or discuss is environment versus employment. Conservation versus economy. You see, as the environmental movement was gaining popular support, <coughs> many began to protest loss of jobs. You know, one example of this is the state of West Virginia. Or if you go to the region of the state of Southwest Virginia, you will see <coughs> ghost towns that were once mining communities. If you go to Teleco Plains, where I'm from in Tennessee, you'll see a ghost town. It's a big trailer park. Why? Because once upon a time, it was a logging town where all of my ancestors worked in the timber industry. I grew up learning to cut trees and working in the timber industry because that's what it was. But it's not a sustainable form of, um, you know, it's, it's just not good for the environment to cut down all the trees, obviously. And so many of those jobs have begun to disappear. Um, it's not good for the environment to uh, level mountains and extract the coal from them. And so those jobs have begun to disappear. Uh, and so again, that, that balance of conservation with economic progress, because so often we will choose what benefits our bottom line. 